Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to QI Connect. I hope you enjoyed that short interlude of our music. This is our first session since the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 as a global pandemic. And we know that for many of you on this call, if not everyone, the last four months have been particularly challenging. We've made the decision to restart QI Connect as we know it's a valuable opportunity for colleagues across health and social care and beyond to learn from international leaders in the fields of improvement, innovation and integration. However, we've refocused all of our sessions for the rest of the year on the issues relevant to our new context. So welcome back to QI Connect. I'm now going to pass you over to Jeff, who will tell you a bit more about the session and the technology. Good afternoon, Jeff. Good afternoon, Ruth. Um, so I'm just going to take you through some housekeeping slides for the start of the session. So if you could just use the chat function that you see on the right hand of the screen to communicate. Um, so this is a very interactive session, so we like to encourage a lot of um, interaction in the chat box. Um, any technical difficulties, such as not being able to hear the presenters speak, or if you keep losing connection, if you could just message the event manager using the chat function, or call the number that you see on the screen. Okay. And um, these sessions, so these sessions are designed to be interactive learning experience. We do encourage you to use the chat. Um, so if you just select all participants from the drop down menu in the chat box, type your message and then click send. Okay, and I'll just pass back to Ruth to tell you all about our competition. Great, thank you. And I, I notice in the chat box that there are some folk who are saying they can't hear anything. Um, you do need to dial in on this one as well as via the computer. Apologies for that. I know that for many of us now, we're used to just joining in on the computer. We have just posted um, in the chat box to remind you of the dial-in details. So please, if you've got no sound, do dial in via those numbers that are now in the chat box. Thank you. So regular QI connectors will know that we run a competition at every session where we ask you to identify the flag of one of the countries participating in this session. The first person to correctly identify the flag will win a small prize. So in a minute, we're going to show you a screen full of flags of all the countries that join QI Connect. And I'm going to give you the name of a country and ask you to pick out their flag. To do that, you are going to need to select the annotation tool. So if you hover over your slides at the moment, you should see on the left hand side this uh, toolbar popping up. And if you can click on the squiggle um, that's highlighted on the screen, but click on it on the toolbar, you do that now. Okay. Now what you should find is that there's an arrow there. So if you click on the arrow and don't do anything else, that will have you ready. So in a minute, when I put the next slide up with the flag, it will be the first person to click on the flag for Norway who wins the prize. Okay, so I think the first person here was Kath Kenzie. Great. So, um, congratulations to, I think, was that Kath Kenzie? Kath Kennedy. Kath Kennedy. Yes. Um, you will win the QI Connect mug, um, much in demand. <coughs> Due to COVID-19, unfortunately, we can't access our supply at the moment. They're in the office. But we promise we will take your details and we will send it on to you as soon as we manage to get back into the offices. 
so today, I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to our new audience members from Ecuador and Yemen who are joining us for the first time today. So as well as staff from across a wide range of health and social care services in Scotland, we're also joined by colleagues across the world. And we now have over 1,300 organizations linking into QI Connect, including 89 universities and colleges. Delivering big virtual events is definitely a team task. So a big thank you to the QI Connect team who are called out here, who work so hard to ensure that these events work smoothly. Now, I am delighted today to welcome and introduce Sir Harry Burns. After graduating in medicine in 1974 from Glasgow University, he went on to become a consultant surgeon at Glasgow Royal Infirmary. He then completed his MSc in Public Health, and in 1994, he was appointed as Director of Public Health for Greater Glasgow Health Board. In 2005, he became the Chief Medical Officer for Scotland. So during his illustrious career, Sir Harry has been at the vanguard of highlighting both the importance of social and economic determinants of health and well-being. He's also been a key voice nationally and internationally on methods for delivering change in complex social systems. And as part of that, he's been a key promoter of the vital role that improvement science plays. He is currently a professor of global public health at Strathclyde University and is also a very popular keynote speaker at both the national and international level. So we were delighted when he agreed to do a session for QI Connect. And on a personal note, he is someone who has both inspired and positively challenged me on many occasions, including latterly in his role as UK ambassador to the Siena Network, which is part funded by the Health Foundation. And it was at the Siena meetings that we discovered that we shared a passion for Motown karaoke. Now, I couldn't convince him to sing for you today, but what he has agreed to do is to share his invaluable insight around well-being, a topic that is highly relevant to our current context and which I know is going to generate a lot of interest in discussion today. So without further ado, let me hand you over to Professor Sir Harry Burns. Thanks, Ruth. And if we could have the first slide. Um, thank you. Um, so, as Ruth has said, for the first 15 years of my career, I Okay, I think we have temporarily lost Sir Harry. So if you can just bear with us for a moment, we will be working in the background to get him back on the line. So please don't panic. It's not just your phone that's lost sound. We've all lost him, but we will get him back. And just to confirm, yes, we are recording this, so you will be able to watch back. And to Stephen, you really do not want me to sing you a song. I think that would be considered talk. Hi. Hi, I'm back. back enough. Great. Welcome back. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry about that. So, uh, <coughs> saying for the first few years of my life I was a, of my medical life I was a, a surgeon 
and I worked in a large teaching hospital in the east end of Glasgow, which served what was economically the most deprived area of the United Kingdom, the lowest life expectancy uh, of any local authority area in, in the UK. And I used to operate on people who lived in houses like this. You can see this man walking through a very poor, unlooked after area. And he was due to die about 12 to 14 years earlier than the more affluent people who lived a few miles away. And what occurred to me was that what always appeared on the death certificates of these guys was a biological cause of death, a, a molecular cause of death. And yet we knew that, this, that the environment in which he lived was responsible for knocking those years off his life. It seemed to me that as a surgeon trying to operate on cancers and damage caused by alcohol and so on, it seemed to me that people living in that area didn't need my surgery. What they needed was more well-being. So next slide, I gave up. Um, I gave up surgery and went off to study public health to find out what causes wellness, what causes some people to be well and live long, healthy, productive lives, while in the same city other people did not achieve that. Next slide, thanks. One of the first things I encountered in trying to understand well-being was this word salutogenesis. This slide comes from colleagues in the Nordic School of Public Health. As a doctor, you learn a lot about pathogenesis, the causes of disease. This is the first time I had seen this term salutogenesis, Salus being the Roman goddess of well-being. And what colleagues in, in Scandinavia had done was they'd pulled together over 20 different theories as to what might cause us to be well. Things like quality of life, hopefulness, optimism, uh, empowerment, locus of control. So I set about reading all of these things and I almost made it. Uh, ecological system theory beat me. I didn't get that far. Next slide, please. So what basically these theories were telling us was if you have a positive, optimistic outlook on life and a sense of feeling in control of your life, you're in control of your life, not other people. If you have a sense of purpose, a reason to get out of bed in the morning, a job or a family to look after. If you feel confident that you can deal with the problems that people surround you. And if you're linked into a a supportive network of people. Those are the factors that come up most of the time in those theories of well-being. So, next slide, please. It seemed to me that the um, that the best way of beginning to investigate this was one particular theory uh, from um, a guy called Antonovsky who said that you must be able to find a social and physical environment round about you as understandable, manageable, and meaningful. Otherwise, you would experience a state of chronic stress. Now, as a surgeon, I was used to causing stress in people. That's what a surgical operation is. And my research was looking at the way in which different people responded in stress terms to their operation. And what we were finding was the lower down the social scale you were, when you had an operation, your stress responses were more vigorous than people further up the social scale having the same operation. And it seemed to me that investigating chronic stress would be an important way of proceeding. Next slide. So, we began to look for evidence that the circumstances in which you lived created stress. And this slide is Canadian data, which looked at stress levels, levels of cortisol in children in orphanages. The longer a child is separated from its parents, from a single significant adult to look after it, the more stressed it becomes. Next slide, thanks. 
So Michael Marmot and his colleagues at University College London looked at stress according to how high up a hierarchy you were in your job. And they looked at the United Kingdom uh, civil service and they found that lower grade in the civil service, the lower down the scale you were, the higher your stress levels are. Now, this was counterintuitive. We always believe that the guy at the top of any organization carries most of the stress. That's not what happens. The red dots on this graph are daytime stress levels, beginning in the morning and ending in the evening, and lower grade civil servants. And the purple ones are higher grade civil servants. And if you think about it, that makes sense because the boss in any organization has lots of people to hand off things he doesn't want to do. If, if a minister asks a senior civil servant to do something and he doesn't want to do it, he just gives it to the next person down the line. And it goes all the way down the line until the person at the bottom of the chain of command has no one to hand it off to and is permanently stressed. Next slide, thanks. Even at whole country level, you can see the impact of um, sense of control, feeling of being in control of your life. This is, study that, this is a study that members of Michael Marmot's group did not long after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the reintegration of European countries into Europe. So what they did was they went around countries of the former Soviet bloc and they asked people in those countries how much control did they feel they had over their lives? In the bottom right-hand corner, Poland and the Czech Republic, they reported high levels of control and they had the lowest annual death rate. That relationship was statistically significant going to the left where the Russians reported the lowest level of perceived control and the highest death rate. Feeling you are in control of your life seems to confer a resistance to illness and a longer life. Next slide. We saw something similar being reported in the last few years from the United States. This slide is a study done by a Scot, Angus Deaton, and his wife, Anne Case. Angus Deaton is a Nobel Prize winning economist who works in the United States. And what he showed was that from about the year 2000 and 2000 onwards to 2012, the number of deaths in men and women between in their early 50s due to drugs, alcohol, and suicide in the United States increased very significantly. They went up by about two, three hundred percent. And he called these deaths deaths of despair. And you can see that compared to other countries like Germany and France that had seen a decline in those deaths, the United States saw very great increases. And this coincided with the period in the United States where working class people lost jobs, where car factories in Detroit began to close, where steelworks began to close, where mines were closing and so on. White non-Hispanics in the United States had experienced significant increase in deaths due to drugs, alcohol, and suicide. And a few years later, the Brookings Institute maps mapped where those deaths of this next slide please mapped where those deaths of despair occurred, and they actually mapped very closely to the areas that voted for Donald Trump in the last u s election so when people become hopeless when they feel that 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 the traditional way of running a country and so on has, has let them down, they turn to extreme, in, extremes in politics. So it's a complex set of behaviors here that are associated with this feeling of despair and negativity that's associated with a premature mortality. Next slide, please. Now, I, as I say, was a scientist, not a politician, and began to try and understand what it was that was causing this chronic elevation of the stress response. And I began to see that in some detail when I visited an American 
uh, university and saw the results of an experiment they were doing on macaque monkeys. And the experiment was making baby monkeys depressed. You can see in this picture the little baby monkey on the left looks pretty depressed. He's not connecting to his mother and sibling and so on. He's introspective, withdrawn. And the way they made the baby monkeys depressed was changing the way the monkeys were fed. In one half of the animal house, the babies were playing and the food was lying out. And when the baby indicated to its mum it was hungry, mum could reach down, find the food, feed the baby, and they carried on playing. The other half of the animal house, they took the food away from the babies and the babies, when indicated they were hungry, mum had to leave the babies, go away, forage for the food, fight with other mums to get the food. So those babies had the experience of their monkeys disappearing for part of the day and feeling stressed by the experience. So mum was stressed and absent, you would naturally think it would be those babies who would also feel stressed, I guess. Well, in fact, you would be wrong. Next slide, please. This slide shows the stress levels in the monkeys. The yellow triangles are the stress levels in the monkey where mum found it easy to feed them. The green triangles are the stress levels where mum found it hard to feed them. And the red triangles are the stress levels in the babies when they randomly change the feeding pattern from one day to the next. Mum being there and mum not being there didn't make any difference. It was baby not knowing what the rules were, not knowing what was going on. It was inconsistent parenting that caused this problem. So there you had the first sign that the way in which young people were being reared the way in which they were growing up, the circumstances in which they were growing up, seemed instrumental in causing the stress level. Next slide, please. Not only did it cause the babies to be stressed, but as they grew up, they became obese. So we currently have the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom announcing a great program for reducing obesity. And we're all got to get on our bicycles and take exercise and so on. Actually, a good way of preventing obesity is to support families with young children to give those young children a consistent upbringing. Next slide. So what was then, what was it about this inconsistent parenting that was causing the elevation in the stress response? And again, from the same university in New York, we discovered that inconsistent parenting changed the way brains developed. And there were three key areas in this study that changed the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. The prefrontal cortex was a bit of the brain that you use for making good decisions. It does not develop so well in the monkeys that experience inconsistent parenting. The hippocampus is very important for spatial memory, but it's generally important for learning. So children who experience inconsistent parenting, their hippocampus doesn't grow so well, and they are less well able to learn at school. And the amygdala is the bit of the brain that lights up when you're emotionally aroused and it becomes more active. So these children are more anxious, aggressive, fearful. They become less well able to control their emotions and less well able to learn at school. So they're more likely to be bullied at school, they're more likely to react badly, they're more likely to be excluded from school because of bad behavior. And as a result, they are then on a path of failure in life. Now, these were monkey studies, and we decided in, in Scotland to see, is, were we finding a way, or could we find a way of seeing what was happening in humans? And so we got human volunteers, next slide, to have their brain scanned. And I was slightly anxious about asking Glaswegians 
residents of Glasgow could we scan your brain and I shouldn't have uh, worried because they were only too anxious to have their brain scanned because that would mean we could prove that they actually had a brain. They were, had been persistently told through life they were stupid, they were useless, they were all this kind of stuff. And here we were showing that they had the same pattern of brain change as we saw in those monkeys experiencing inconsistent parenting. This slide is a section that you use as part of measuring hippocampal volume and so on. And it was exactly the same thing that we predicted from the monkey studies. So early life is absolutely critical in determining um, what your outcome is. Can I have the next slide? We went on to measure um, various aspects of behavior in affluent and deprived people showing these brain changes. The study, if anyone wants to look it up, the papers associated with it have this word, so good, psychological and social and biological indicators of disease. That's what that stands for. This was one thing that we measured choice reaction time. This is a measure of prefrontal cortex. This measures the length of time it takes you to take in new information, process it, and act on it. So in this uh, testing this, you have a computer in front of you that flashes up something and it measures the length of time you take to um, press the correct button. And what this shows is that the most deprived people take about 200 milliseconds longer to press the right button than the least deprived people. And that's true across the age range. And if 200 milliseconds doesn't sound very much, just imagine two cars being driven side by side, one car at 40 miles an hour, one car being driven by a guy who is affluent, one guy being driven by a guy who has had a deprived upbringing, and a child walks out in front of them. The car being driven by the guy from the deprived background will take about two car lengths longer to stop. Not because he's not paying attention, but simply because his brain processes the information more slowly. So that kind of early life experience handicaps you in all sorts of ways that people would find surprising. Next slide. So the next part of the jigsaw was to try and understand why is it that that kind of experience, that kind of early childhood, leads to chronic elevation of stress levels in the body, because it's those stress levels that produce that abnormal pattern of brain growth. And this slide comes from a colleague at McGill University in uh, Montreal, Michael Meany. Michael studied the brains of young people who had died in accidents, and he found that key genes in their brain were not activated. There was an epigenetic abnormality in their brain. And when he went back and looked at their upbringing, it was the children who had experienced violent or difficult or neglect in their, in their childhood that uh, had the absent genes. So what you see is that when children are nurtured, when they're cuddled, when they're made to feel happy and safe, they produce in their brain a level of um, hydroxy, 5 hydroxytryptamine, also known as serotonin, uh, that circulates in the bloodstream. It's picked up by a transport mechanism and taken into the center of cells, where on chromosome number 5, there is a gene called the glucocorticoid receptor gene. The serotonin activates this gene, which acts as a measure of how stressed you are. When it senses cortisol levels going up, it sends messages down the spinal cord to the, uh, to the adrenals to switch off production of cortisol. And if babies don't experience that, that nurturing early life, they don't produce the spikes in serotonin and they don't switch on the gene. So the next phase was to look at studies that have looked at adversity in early life. 
And the Adverse Childhood Events Study carried out in California and carried out in middle class Californians. Next slide, please. These, these, these people were middle class because they, it came from, they came from the Kaiser Permanente healthcare system. To be a member of that, you have to have a level of, of um, material well-being. You have to be able to pay to be a member of it. And the clinicians there started a weight reduction clinic. And they found, as they were going through this weight reduction clinic, that there was a, con a relationship between obesity and the history of adversity in early life. So they turned it, that obesity study into an adverse childhood event study, and they asked people about their experience of nine different types of adverse events, three different types of abuse, a couple of different types of neglect, domestic substance abuse, domestic violence, parental mental illness, or parental criminality. And they found, for example, in the next slide, for example, Children who had four or more adverse events were about eight times more likely to become alcoholics than children who had no adverse events. That um, substance misuse was, was significantly more likely where there were lots of adverse events. Next slide, please. Boys who experienced parental physical abuse were eight times more likely to perpetrate violence against their own partners, about four times more likely to be arrested for carrying weapons than, than boys who experienced no uh, physical abuse. So you can see that that kind of adversity in early life leads to difficulties at school, leads to difficulties in behavior, leads to increased risk of, of incarceration, increased risk of addictions and so on, and that is producing wide variations in, in uh, life expectancy. Also, increased uh, differences in obesity and so on. Next slide, please. It wasn't just the Californian study that showed this. In the city of Dunedin in the South Island of New Zealand in the early 70s, about 1,000 children were recruited into a cohort study. They identified at age three children that they defined as being at risk on the basis of the circumstances in which they lived and so on. And now in their 40s, those at-risk children have turned out to be significantly more likely to be unemployed, have criminal convictions for violence, experience teenage pregnancy, be substance misusers, and having metabolic syndrome associated with elevated stress responses, insulin resistance, increased risk of type 2 diabetes, and um, obesity. Next slide, please. Now, many of you will be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. Maslow suggested that you start off by producing, um, by providing people with physiological needs, you know, access to food, water, security, and then they move on into positive relationships, loving family, then they acquire self-esteem, and at the end, self-actualization, which he defined as morality, creativity, problem solving, etc., etc., etc. And Maslow's hierarchy has led to people believing that in order to produce a positive um, uh, lifestyle in someone, you need to provide all the basics first. Well, I have to tell you, Maslow was spectacularly wrong. Next slide, thanks. That is what Maslow's hierarchy should need. Self-actualization comes first, and as a result, all the other things come again. And when I realized this, this came about because I spoke to lots and lots of people who had lived through difficult circumstances and acquired an ability in later life to get things right. And I typed into Google, Maslow was wrong. I thought, Maslow was upside down. It's the actualization that comes first. Next slide, please. I came across this story. It seems that in the 1930s, Maslow went to visit a Blackfoot Indian reservation in Canada 
where they told him that their society was based on this right-hand triangle here. But what they told him was, if our young people feel in control of their lives, the community feels in control of its lives, and we have cultural stability and perpetuity, our whole culture is depending on children growing up to be in control. Maslow took that, and because he was growing up at a time when neoclassical economics was saying, no, no, it's all the other way around, it's all about you know, decision-making is the most important thing, he took that bottom uh, bit of the triangle and put it on the top. And as a result, public health thinkers have been misled, I think, for decades because it starts off with the whole process of getting kids to feel in control, to feel loved, to feel needed, to feel happy in the circumstances in which they live. So next slide, please. To get a family feeling well and help the children, we need, as a society, to support the parents. Next slide. But what do we do? Public policy in most countries tends to focus on problems. We focus on problems, we define them by their needs and deficiencies. And as a result, we design our services to fill gaps and to fix their problems for them. Now, these problems are complex, and just doing things, just setting targets for getting people into jobs, targets for uh, reducing, uh, targets for reducing um, obesity and so on, it's much more complicated than that. And the way in which we implement um, public policy makes citizens who do not feel in control of their life even more passive. They become recipients of services because we do things to people rather than with them in ways that help support them to become uh, uh, in control of their own lives. Next slide, please. Next slide, thanks. So just a quote from a French lawyer, a social reformer in the 19th century who I think got it right. The knowledge of social well-being and reform is to be learned not from books, nor from the public platform, but in climbing the stairs to the poor man's garret, sitting by his bedside, feeling the same cold that pierces him, sharing the secrets of his lonely heart and troubled mind. We sought these problems by befriending people, making them feel valued, giving them a sense of self-esteem, and when they've got that sense of self-esteem, they begin to take control of their lives. Next slide, please. In essence, in essence what Ozanam was talking about is what we now in Scotland talk about, the what matters to you approach. And this, I have seen this happen. I mean, one of my best friends now did time in prison for attempted murder. He came from that chaotic background where he felt overwhelmed and so on. And when he went to prison, a prison officer adopted this approach, said, made friends with him, told him he was better than, than he thought. It was a non-judgmental relationship which allowed this chap to build trust and a sense of self-esteem. When he got out of prison, he realized he was free to choose a different way. And he got support to get qualifications and so on. And when you, this happens, when people realign their lives, they always want to come back and support others. The success for policy change, the success for tackling people at the lower end, the problems of people at the lower end of the social scale lies in how we build their sense of self-esteem through quality interactions with them. An example of this was carried out in London some years ago, the Broadway experiment in the city of London. They reckoned they had 13 hardcore rough sleepers who between them had been rough sleeping in the, the, the city of London for between four and 45 years. And no matter what they did, uh, can you Next slide, please. No matter what they did, they couldn't get these rough sleepers to, um, 
to change their what you know their lifestyle. So they decided to do something different. They set up 13 bank accounts and they put three thousand dollars, three thousand pounds in each bank account, and they gave them a social worker who adopted the what matters to you approach. Sat down and befriended them and asked them, okay, what is it you think you need? The first thing, first person she spoke to said, could I get a new pair of spectacles? I, I like to read the papers that people throw away and I've lost my spectacles and I can't read anymore. The second guy asked for a hearing aid. The most expensive thing anyone asked for was this guy who said the only time in his life he had ever been was the time his family would go on holiday to a caravan park in the south of England. Could he see if there was a disused caravan there that he might buy with the money and he would go and live in it? A year later, 11 of these 13 hardcore rough sleepers were in permanent accommodation. Some had jobs. And the average spend out of the £3,000 bank accounts was £800. What had happened was that social worker had built a sense of control in these abilities and gave them the ability to make choices. Next slide, please. That well-known left-wing rag, The Economist, um, described the Broadway experiment in terms of realizing that the most efficient way to spend money on the homeless might be to give it to them. Make them feel good about themselves. Next slide, please. In the Beacon and Old Hill Estate in Falmouth, between 1996 and 2004, two health visitors set about transforming that place. It had been a place of full employment because there was a naval dockyard in Falmouth, and when it closed down, all the men in this estate of about 3,000 people became unemployed and it became a basket case of crime, violence, um, domestic abuse and so on. And these two health visitors decided that the police weren't doing anything, the local authority wasn't doing anything to help. They needed to try and make change happen. They wrote to 50 households and invited people to come to a public meeting. Five people turned up at that public meeting. Those five people, those two health visitors, started the What Matters to You approach. They knocked on doors and asked people, what do you think would make a difference? And it started off, most people were saying, well, the place is really run down, it's a mess, the gardens are overgrown, the house is painted. So they got money to buy some tools and they started improving the gardens. And one of the health visitors said to me once, that the, goal, the gardens were so overgrown that as they were hacking away the bushes and trees in this garden, they discovered a long forgotten abandoned Ford Transit van that people had simply forgotten was there. But by showing people that they could take control over their lives, over those eight years, crime went down, postnatal depression went down, Unemployment went down, child protection registration went down, teenage pregnancies almost disappeared. So giving that sense of control, helping people to live their lives in a much better way, it has time after time has shown improvements. Next slide, please. At the moment, the Scottish Government is considering the introduction of a universal basic income, a citizen income, as it was known when it was piloted in the United States and Canada. The pilots showed spectacular improvements in outcome. In Canada, it reduced domestic violence, it reduced uh, parental mental health problems, hospitalizations in general were down about almost 10%. In a town in Illinois that was devastated by the loss of its steelworks, low birth weight babies all declined dramatically. Um, uh, when it was introduced, people said, oh, if you give it to pregnant mothers, they'll just buy drugs with it. Actually, what they did was they bought food with it. In New Jersey, they reported high school graduations up significantly. And Richard Nixon, the president at the time, was about to put a bill into Congress to make citizens' income a, a, a right 
a, a, a right for all American citizens. However, the whole bill was torpedoed because in the town of Seattle reported that divorces had increased by about 50%. And this is what they said about it. They said, this is what happens when you make women financially independent from their husbands, they get divorced from them. Well, a few years after the bill was pulled, someone went into Seattle and looked at the data, and it was state news. It was completely false. There had been no increase in divorce rate. So there will always be people whose personal interests depend on poverty and inequality, and they are the ones that torpedoed citizens' income in the States. Next slide, please. So where does that leave us? What is it that we should be doing? Well, the process of public change in Britain, new public management was introduced really in the thatcher Blair era um, with the introduction of targets for the public sector with sanctions and inspections and people, you know, chief executives lost their jobs and so on. And that was all about keeping power at the centre. That was performance management. What we showed in Scotland over the past decade or two by asking people at the front line, what is it that you think would make a difference? Can you test it and show that it works and then implement it? We reduced doing this by asking frontline staff what would make pregnancy safer and better and so on. We reduced infant mortality by about 15% over six or seven years. Scotland had the highest infant mortality in the UK countries. It's now got the lowest. And that was frontline staff that did it. So we shared power with the frontline staff. What we now need to do, what all this science tells us is that in order to get that better outcome, that narrowing of inequalities in society, we need to co-produce that change with the people in those circumstances, with the people who are experiencing inequality at the lower end. We mobilize social action by giving them power to change their own lives. That's where we need to get to. We need to get to the third curve here. And just I want to finish with one or two quotes. Next slide, please. This man, Joseph Townsend, was a Church of England cleric. Um, he was also a medical doctor, and this is one of his quotes. Hunger will tame the fiercest animals that will teach decency and civility, obedience and subjection. It is only hunger which can spur and goad the poor onto labor. If Joseph Townsend were alive today, I suggest he might be working for the Department of Work and Pension. Because that, with the sanctioning and so on that's going on, a perfect way of of making people feel even lower than they actually do about being unemployed and so on. That seems to be the philosophy which underpins uh, the present benefits policy in the United Kingdom. And I have to tell you that as a, as a medical graduate of Glasgow University, I'm always delighted to tell audiences that Joseph Townsend was a medical graduate of Edinburgh University, one of our rivals. Um, Next slide, please. On the other side of the coin, you've got this guy. The guy in the black suit with the white beard is a Catholic priest who 30 years ago was sent to work in the most violent parish in Los Angeles. LAPD stopped him the day he arrived walking down the street and told him that if he tried to change the way the Latino gangs were working, they would kill him. 30 years on, and you can see here he's not dead and he's surrounded by, he reckons he's probably helped about three or 4,000 families over, over that time transform their lives. And the way he did it was he went out and spoke to them. He would walk up to these guys with machetes and guns and so on, and he would ask them, what matters to you? How are you doing? What can you do? What would you like to do? And they told them that the reason they had gang warfare and the reason they sold drugs and so on was because they had no jobs. The other guy in the black suit is a film producer, a friend of, of his, and he asked this guy to buy a disused bakery, and he started a company called Homeboy Bakeries. 
and that's who you see here. Now, Greg comes to Glasgow periodically, the Violence Reduction Unit in Glasgow, which operates on exactly the same basis as Homeboy Bakery did, invites him to Glasgow. And I had the privilege a few times of taking him around schools, talking to the school children. And this is what he told, tells those school children. What we need is a compassion that stands in awe at the burdens the poor have to carry, rather than one that stands in judgment at how they carry them. That compassion, that caring for others, the desire of helping those others to help themselves is the way forward. And if anyone thinks that present governments with the emergence of right-wing parties and so on that we see in different places, if anyone thinks that they are going to share power, well, you're more optimistic than I am. However, one of those optimistic people is this guy. Next slide, please. Next slide. All right. This guy, Terry Waite, was imprisoned um, by Hezbollah in the Lebanon in the 1980s, I think it was. He was held in prison for five years um, incommunicado, not allowed to, he wasn't even allowed to see his jailer. His jailer, when he had his jailer coming, he had to blindfold himself and food would be left. And for five years, he didn't know anything about him. He was sent to Lebanon as a, an emissary from the Church of England. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury wanted him to help to heal the vision there. And what, I once had dinner with Terry Waite, and during the whole dinner, I didn't stop laughing. A man without a, a shred of regret or blame about him, all he wanted to do was tell me funny stories about that time. And at the end of this experience, I asked him, what is the future for the Middle East? How do you see it being changed? And this is what he told me. At the end of the day, love and compassion will win. So what I would say to you is that what my life history tells me, what the science that I've investigated tells me, is that caring for each other, starting from before birth, caring for that pregnant woman who may be living in poverty and living in a violent relationship and so on, caring for the families that are struggling, helping them look after their children and, and loving their children, and Reaching a hand out to the people who have failed is the way forward. That more than anything, that more than giving people free bicycles, that more than giving people lectures on turning up to the Department of Work and Pensions on time, that is the way in which we will transform our society. And with that, I'll stop and I'm happy to take questions if any arise. Great. Thank you so much, Sir Harry. The chat box has been absolutely alive with discussions and questions. Um, but we're going to start today with our guest questioner, Diana Heckerim, who's a colleague from HIS, who is our Head of Transformational Redesign. Um, and as part of that role, Diana has led the development of the COVID-19 Health and Social Care Learning in Scotland Toolkit, um, which is supporting people's needs and well-being in this challenging time. We've uh, posted a link there on the slides that will be available after this if you're interested in finding out more. Diana, over to you for your questions. Thank you, and thank you for an amazingly insightful presentation. Um, what we saw within this work that Ruth has just referred to was the importance of supporting well-being across staff, but also people in communities, and especially as you've really powerfully put, especially those who might be categorised as vulnerable or facing inequalities. But we've also, the examples that we've captured is how much the community organisations have stepped up and been able to support in supporting positive well-being in these areas. And I suppose my question is, do you think there's enough being done to create the sustainability of this community response and indeed what more could be done to enable the community to continue to sustainably support well-being. 
Well, that's that's the six million dollar question, isn't it, or the six trillion dollar question, or however much we've become so used to uh, the prime minister and so on telling us about how many trillions of pounds we put into this, that, and the next thing, and so on. In fact, you're absolutely right. The, the care that I have seen just locally of people reaching out to the elderly, those that are shielding, and so on, and helping them out, and going shopping for them and so on has been very heartening. Can we sustain it? Will it all just go back to normal once lockdown finishes and so on? Um, I suspect it will go back to the way it was if we have um, if we uh, you know, if we're not careful it'll just settle back down and in fact people there will be some resentment as we get towards Christmas if people are still having to socially distance and so on. You know, Christmas is cold, so you want to go into a pub and have a nice beer or something like that. And, you know, so suddenly we will, if we are still trying to avoid further outbreaks by then, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet that we won't be doing that, um, then there might be resentment building up. But what we need are stories. It was a, so I you know, I did all this research early on and realized that what the biology of this was, but it was the stories of the people whose lives had been transformed that showed me the importance of that human to human caring and compassion. And I would say that as I go around the country talking about this kind of thing, and people come up to me with stories, everyone has an experience of it, and we need those stories to be told more in order to make more people realize the power they have to transform each other's lives. So it's, I, I don't think we leave this to politicians, although I have to say, I just to, uh, just tell you a story. When I go to, when I speak up to either to a parliamentary committee or something like that, what I, the story I tell tends to appeal quite well to the those on the left. You know, it's social justice and so on. And the last time I went, I decided to tell folk on the right that if they looked after families and encouraged children to to um, be nurtured and so on. What this would happen was those kids would grow up, they'd be engaged at school, they would get jobs, they wouldn't go to jail, and they'd pay taxes. And one of the Conservatives came up to me after and they said, oh, you've convinced me. I'll need to write a paper for the Conservative Party on this. Now, I'm still waiting. I'm not holding my breath on that. But it's that kind of thing. We need to create a social movement that says caring for each other, irrespective of the politics of the situation, makes everyone's life better. So, I mean, I guess the end point of that answer is, um, yeah, a social movement is what's needed. And a social movement based on improvement science. You know, get people to try and do things and test them and tell everyone about them and then implement them at scale. Fantastic, thank you. We we are out of time, unfortunately. <laughs> but Eileen Miles has posted her question twice, and it's a very specific one. So I, I recognise some folk may need to leave, but I am just going to ask it for her, given her persistence. Thank you, Eileen. And she's asking if there are any recent studies in relation to stormy neonatal periods in relation to cortisol stress and reduced parental positive contacts due to medical interventions in need? I, I am not aware of any of those studies, and I think it'd be very difficult to do if you're talking about stormy neonatal periods. Um, you know, I presume you're talking about um, you know, the present situation where people have been ill and maybe um, babies taken away from infected mothers or whatever, something like that. That actually be quite difficult to do. Um, one of the things that we're interested in uh, is the stress responses 
uh, across um, across social divides and across ethnic groups because it's known that there are there are different responses in certain ethnic groups uh, to stress and uh, not not the South Asian ones. I'm not familiar of any studies carried out in South Asians, but Pacific Island uh, Islanders have different stress patterns. That's a study I know about. Um, so there may well be differences, but I don't know of any study that's been done. And I think to do it would be extremely difficult to control it to find a control group. Right. Thank you so much for answering that. And as I say, the chat box has been absolutely alive this afternoon. Um, that was just an amazing presentation for Harry. There are so many people commenting on how inspired they've been by the session this afternoon. Um, and the number commenting as well about how inspired they've been by you through the course of their careers. Thank you so much. Um, before we finish, just to highlight for everyone, that we have revised our lineup for the rest of the year in wake of the pandemic. Um, and we are just finalizing the speakers. We should have the news soon. Um, and if you watch our website and the mailing list, we will be sending out details. We're hoping that our next session will be on World Patient Safety Day on the 17th of September. And also just to remind everyone, that the back catalogue um, is available for you to watch and enjoy on our website, or you can visit the QI Connect YouTube channel. So it just remains for me to thank you all for joining us today, uh, for bearing with us through some of those technical difficulties and for interacting so enthusiastically throughout this session. We hope to see you all at our next session and remember, we will be confirming the speaker and the focus of that session shortly. Thank you, everyone. On behalf of all of the participants, Sir Harry, thank you so much for that inspiring presentation. Bye, all.